people, 24, about 24 people that will be staffing this. We'll have one database for all this stuff instead of the multitude of databases that are out there and, uh, and see if we can knock this out. We, uh, we can't continue to allow our soldiers to make these sacrifices, you know, without care and form. It's, it's simply a disservice and we're failing our soldiers. And uh, again, if the Army breaks you, the Army needs to fix you. So that, that's our plan. Um, and again, I will be happy to take questions later about any one of these four areas. Thank you. Okay, Joe McDade, my deputy, will talk about civilian workforce transformation. Sir, thank you. Uh, if we could go to the next chart, please. Start with an, uh, an axiomatic statement, and I think most of you have been paying attention to R4Gen would see this as a true statement, that R4Gen requires our institutions to adapt. And when you talk about institutions, the United States Army, in many ways, we're talking, uh, the preponderance of the weight is really focused on the generating force. When you take a look at the generating force, you say, well, how many people are in the generating force and what do they look like? Well, the statistic I want to draw your attention to is what percentage of the generating force are civilians? When we take a look up here, our latest statistics are 56%. Now, when I get to the next bullet, uh, I hope to start getting your attention because 60% of those civilians who are the majority of our generating force don't have what we call a career program. So for the wearing uniforms right now, what that means is those civilians enter our force, they don't have a career path, they don't have anyone helping to manage their careers, and they're basically told they're on their own. So you say to yourself, well, you know, we've been fighting two wars, we've got a generating force that seems to be doing a pretty good job, so what are some of the problems with what you're seeing out there in our force right now? Take a look at the next bullet. I think this is a phenomenal statement that we can show right now of the new hires that we bring into our force, the new hires. We can expect one-third to leave within five years. When you take a look at your generating force as primarily comprised now of knowledge workers, and it takes us a fair amount of time to bring them on board, General Pharisee, if you look at losing up to a third within five years, you've got a real significant challenge on your hands. And one of the reasons, and our most recent surveys show, the second most likely reason that a civilian is citing for leaving our force is a lack of career advancement. So when you put these things together, you see to yourself, we have a good generating force. But to be adaptive and flexible in the 21st century, we need an outstanding, a great generating force. And we need to get after some opportunities. And the next bullet really is potentially an opportunity. In the next year, we're going to move every four-star headquarters in the continental United States. And that alone is fairly significant. But now you take into account some of the statistics that General Pharisee just mentioned to you. We expect something like 70% of the civilians who are currently manning those headquarters not to make the move. So that's a significant drain in intellectual cop capital. That's a significant opportunity in the world's worst economy for the United States Army to go out and recruit the very highest quality civilians this Army's ever seen. The problem then becomes if you bring them on board and 60% are told, hey, welcome to the United States Army. We're going to work you really hard and you're on your own. We see attrition rates that I think we as an army have got to get after because we as an army, if you go to the next, next chart, we've been looking at this problem for a long time. Uh, I'm curious in the audience, was, was anybody out there involved in the retail study back in 2006? Yeah, near and dear to your heart. That was a pretty significant effort. And in 2006, this is the problem statement that the, the study uh, gave to the senior leaders of our army. The Army doesn't have a civilian development system that's well managed, integrated, or sufficiently resourced to develop a civilian core for the 21st century. That was the problem statement in 2006. We have launched a new initiative in our Army called Civilian Workforce Transformation. Guess what? It has exactly the same problem statement. So something happened uh, between the retail study and now, and, and maybe some things didn't happen. So if we go to the next chart, let me just give you the highlight of what we're going to get after here. Because for those of you in, in the front row, people uh, who were involved in the retail study would say, well, this sounds familiar. Um, the first thing we've got to get after are the requirements process for civilians. There is no TAA-like process for civilians. When we do a concept plan in our Army, it takes us a while to do that. And when it comes time to try and get your concept plan funded, we're finding the connection between the requirements process and the budget process isn't nearly as tight as it should be, and many, many commander requirements for concept plans don't end up getting funded. So we need to do better there. 
The second area that I would uh, draw your attention to is it's a system of systems. So if you go after one piece of the civilian problem and focus on that exclusively, you find out that you really haven't fixed the problem. So we're going to take a look at STEM to Stern, the civilian life cycle from recruiting to retirement, and make sure that as we go through this transformation, we're keeping an eye on the entire system. The other area that we've talked about, obviously, an integrated management system, I won't bore you with the details, but we're going to get after that in a fairly significant way. The last two are things, though, that uh, if you're going to be here for the civilian luncheon tomorrow, I really urge you to, to try and pay attention and come to that luncheon because the undersecretary of our Army is going to be making some significant announcements about the things I've just mentioned to you and why in 2010 and 11 we're not going to be in the same position we were at the end of the retail study. So stay, stand by with that kind of leadership behind us. I think what you're going to find up here is the next two things we're going to get after, civilian leadership development and improving our hiring process have got to be things that this Army focuses on. And again, I would suggest to you, if the generating force is as important to our Army as we think it is, and our Ford Gen, and preparing this Army for an uncertain future, then the leadership development investment we're making in our civilians has got to be on an equal set footing with our soldiers. Now, I'm not talking about every civilian. Civilians have choices. Many civilians like what they do today, and they want to be the best at what they're doing in a particular location. But there is a relatively small subset that would say, I want to be the best Army civilian I can be. I want to be the best Army civilian leader I can be. And I'm willing to step up to the plate to do what the Army wants me to do, to have a broad enough background so that I can be placed in in-charge positions in key jobs for our Army in the 21st century. If we have civilians that are willing to make that kind of commitment to our Army, then we need to make a social commitment with those civilians and say, if you're willing to live up to your end of the bargain, we will fund, we will resource, and we will make it easy for you to do the things that we as an Army require you to do. So again, uh, I won't uh, bore you with the details, anxious for questions, but I would say tomorrow at the Army uh, Civilian Luncheon, the Under Secretary of the United States Army is going to talk about civilian workforce transformation, and at the end of it, he's going to be saying, here's why what I'm proposing to do is different than anything that you've seen in the Army before. So with that, uh, I'll open it up to questions, sir. Okay, well, thanks, Joe, and thanks to all the panel members here. Uh, hopefully, in the last hour or so, we've touched on something uh, that uh, has piqued your interest that you would like to ask questions about. And, and if not, uh, as you know, we're, we're involved in a lot of other areas. Uh, I could go on and on, but, but there are a lot of areas, other areas that we are working, and if you have questions in those areas that were not covered, uh, feel free to ask, and, and we'll do our best to address your questions. So at this point, we're ready to take your questions. Sir. <laughs> Sir, first of all, thanks for, uh, for all of you for taking care of our most precious resource, our soldiers. Um, three quick points. Uh, first point, yesterday uh, the chief talked about um, the master resiliency training going on in military form number one. The major takeaway from that is that although the active component has really got into that fast, um, the reserve component and guard are lagging far, far behind. Issues that they talked about range from civilians or uh, the spouses not being able to get AKO access to get in to do the comprehensive fitness survey, much less get into some of the re master resilience training modules. So um, that's a big void, and there's a big gap there, particularly when you hear the numbers of what we're augmenting our force with, particularly on the CS and CS side of the house. Um, and those guys are rapid, rapidly, you know, their dwell time is, is bad. So it, it fits right back into the chart that showed the suicide problems and all that. Well, the gap is the home base, the balance isn't there, but then finding out about how to get balance and how to get training there is there. So the first point is, we got to we got to get access uh, to that. Um, in conjunction with that, that, we made a point about reservists and, and guard guys getting beat up. I sat on um, the previous Veterans Administration Care Panel, okay, and was looking at basically it's like the equivalent of BRAC for what's going on with veteran hospitals. The amount of psychological traumas that all of our soldiers are going through, particularly on the reserve side, is a growing problem that I'm hoping that General Shinseki's panel is really looking at because 
even though we're kind of keeping veterans hospitals alive, there are the waiting lines for their mental health and particularly their physical therapy, you know, for guys getting dinged both physically and mentally, the lines are out the doors. And that number is going to grow and grow and grow. It's not going to get any smaller in the next, you know, two to three years. So that's, that's the second problem I'm kind of laying out here in, in front of the panel. The last thing for, for Mr. McDade is um, intern programs could really help a lot if we just fund them. Uh, I spent my last five years in TRADOC and only because Mr. Seeger finally got some money for 1750s for instructional design guys, we started to think about interns. Um, when I was at Aberdeen at the ch as a chief up there, I watched 98 people at Redstone Arsenal saying I'm going to move to Fort Lee. How many moved to Fort Lee? Three. And I had no intern programs for things like RMs and trainers that just are buying for that. The only way you get past that is to insource it for a couple of years. But tell industry you're going to in insource it and then do that. But the career path program that you talked about in terms of, okay, now I'm in, how do I go? That has often been, been a thing, and that was part of General Dempsey's human capital enterprise study that we did at, at TRADOC about a year and a half ago. That, that, was, that was a finding as well. So um, it's a repeat theme, but I think the big thing is, is on that, Joe, is just resourcing it. Right. So I'm down. Sir, if I could comment on the second bullet that, okay. that you made, the RC is getting beat up when it comes to medical readiness. We, we, we realize that, and that was part of the General Frank study, is that, again, a soldier has to prove that he's been injured and that he's worthy of a line of duty determination and other things when it comes to the Army Reserve, because we don't treat the Army Reserve at our post camps and stations. We send them back home to Pocatello, Idaho, and says, go figure it out. Um, so one of the things we're going to do with the Army Reserve Medical Readiness Center, the Center of Excellence, once we get through these backlog packets, we're going to look at ways, we've got, again, 50% of the Army docs within the Army Reserve, but we can't bring them on board because of assured access. So they can do their two weeks of AT, but there's no continuum of care for a soldier when you can only treat them for two weeks. So that's one of the, one of the other things we're going to look at. So I just wanted to let you know that's, that's our plan for now, for that one. I, I think just... Kevin, to, to, your, to your last point about the, the whole civilian piece, my boss's challenge to me is we look at how we recruit for the future uh, to try to be more inclusive. You know, we, we turn a lot of the young men and women away because they have medical conditions. A lot of those young men and women have some unique talent skills that they will try to offer to civilian industry or somebody else. Why do we turn them away when they walk into a recruiting station? Why couldn't we say, You've got a graduate degree, and a lot of them do, or an undergraduate degree in this specialty. Have you ever considered being an Army civilian? And so I'm looking at that, studying that as we look at this thing called Pinnacle to take it to the next level and working with uh, Drill Bostic and his team and eventually Gina Farsi uh, and allowing those young men and women that may say, I want to serve, you can't serve, you have a medical condition that precludes that to being able to serve as an Army civilian. So we're, we're going to look at that and study it. And, move out as quickly as we can. Provided that you don't have a moral waiver issue, I would absolutely agree. Yeah, well, you know, right now, I, I, uh, we're, we're on for 1,600 young men, and we, we do college option officer candidate school. And, and, you know, folks say with the economy being the way that it is, it's more than the economy, but what we're, we have to have a board at my level now. We had 300 people with college degrees last month apply for OCS on the option that we present. We could only select 65. Now, there's... I'm not a, I went to K-State, so my math's not real good, but that's a lot of other people that could do some other things for the Army if we had that avenue for them. But the, the intern program, we're all big fans of that, and we've worked hard. Funding is the issue. But uh, to your point, uh, what we've seen is with our interns, after 15 years, 75% of our interns are still with us. So, so this is a very strong program. Now, there's all different types of intern programs, but, but this particular intern program where we bring them in, and continue to develop them is a is a, a worthwhile program and w we almost lost funding this year we went back and we were able to uh, with Dr. Duncan and Joe McDade uh, work it with the, all of the different parts of the army it, but it took four star level involvement from each of the areas to say that this import this program was important to them when you look at my budget we got about 51 billion dollars of budget in in the military personal pay account and 94% of it is must fund uh, entitlement. So, so there's not a lot of wiggle room on different things that 
we, we might do. And with everything that we've got going on in the personnel are arena, it really does come down to resources. And, and most all the programs that we're looking at are, are, are if they're not must fund, we really want to fund them. Um, okay, other questions? Like yeah. a, couple, a couple comments uh, to address the issues you raised. Um, master resilience trainers, MRTs, the only source for those right now is uh, up in Pennsylvania, and the Army is programming those seats. Uh, we have, uh, with the current class, we will have at least one MRT in every state. Now, that falls uh, far short of the mark, and we understand that. We are establishing an MRT center at the Professional Education Center in Little Rock, Arkansas. The expectation is we're going to have that up and running in six months, and so we are going to be the second location in the Army to train MRTs. Uh, and really the employment of those MRTs when they get out there in the state is equally important to make sure that they have access to the soldiers that they need to get with and, uh, and be able to uh, apply the talents that they've got out there. You talked a little bit about access to AKO in a geographically dispersed environment that we have in the reserve component. There's always a struggle to balance the security requirements in AKO and access to uh, the GATT and those kinds of things against uh, providing the service to the soldiers and to the families out there. And by the way, we have trained some family MRTs out there inside of the Army National Guard. Pretty tall order, long ways to go, but we're all about getting at that task. And then finally, the issue that you talked about in terms of behavioral health and medical um, services available to the reserve component. The, the long-term solution in that has to be somewhere between the Veterans Administration and the uh, TRICARE program out there that we have in place right now. There are warts on both of those, to be quite honest with you. We're working through the TRICARE provider piece. We have a program in California where we have a TRICARE uh, counselor who is drilling with each one of the guard units out there, and the effort is to provide, as I mentioned yesterday, to provide a service to the soldier and a drill status, but also to reduce the stigma associated with seeing somebody who is a behavioral health specialist and providing that care. We think that that has great merit, along with another program that the Army is piloting, which is telebehavioral health. As I mentioned, a lot of our soldiers live on the social media, and so we think that delivery of that service, of that care in that environment, where if you have a problem, you can go online and see a behavioral health specialist at your convenience, and support rather than having to make appointments, all those kinds of things. We've got to be smarter about how we deliver this stuff. And then finally, the deputy in the veterans affairs business is a, a young lady named Tammy Duckworth. She is an Illinois guardsman who has lost both of her legs and one of her arms. And she has some history here in terms of not just what the responsibilities of the VA are, but what the reserve component piece of this thing is. And she is a partner, a full partner with General Shinseki as he goes about his work in, try, in terms of trying to adjust the care programs for the, uh, for the VA. Um, you know, my take on this is there's a lot more to this war than crossing the berm headed to Baghdad. And this is the piece, the residual piece, that we have a responsibility to take care of in the long term. Okay, other questions? Ben. I'm Dan Denning with Booz Allen. I had a question about, related, Sam, to your comments on the, uh, the saving the $28 billion. The predicate to, the, to Secretary Gates' initiatives was the Defense Business Board report, and it talked a lot about, or talked somewhat about, the unsustainable personnel costs, the unsustainable health care uh, costs, and made a specific recommendation about taking a look at uh, moving military out of non-soldier jobs, and I think it specifically talked about what they what they term commercial jobs. And I just wondered if if the Army's given any thought to that, starting to look at that. And then secondly, I was curious about uh, any specifics Mr. McDade might provide on civilian leader development. Well, I'm unsure right now. Jay, uh, I, I know that's more in your portfolio, but I am not aware of any effort right now in the Army to look at it. Uh, did Jay plant that question with you? The Army, the military, uh, 
uh, very often is looking at the proper use of the military. And what we have right now is a framework uh, to make sure that we're putting soldiers in, in jobs that really are military essential. Uh, the framework that uh, SECAP has proven is really widely. Here, Jay, Jay. The uh, Army uses a, a process that the SECDEF has, has approved, and what it is is we, uh, we have to make sure that we're putting our soldiers uh, in those jobs that truly require soldier-type skills. And what we have in the Army is a framework that, uh, that, that really is based on what we call the Military Essentiality Code. And every um, position in the generating force, every military position in the generating force uh, has a Military Essentiality Code associated with it. So those of you all who are familiar with uh, tables of distribution and allowances, TDAs. Every TDA military position has one of these codes against it. Um, now, they, they, they aren't um, um, just static. Uh, over time, we, we continue to look at whether or not these type skill sets do require uh, soldiers. Um, and, and we will probably look at it again in the near future, depending on what happens with uh, any potential force structure changes um, that, that come down. Just quickly to follow up on leader development, uh, one of the things that's important about a civilian leader development program is you've got to focus on the requirements. And so what we've done as an Army, we're the first of the institutions to go out and take a look at OPM and DOD's competencies for executives. These are the competencies that you hire against. We've gone out, we mapped it, those against every single position description in the SES core. We interviewed one out of every five SESs to make sure we got it right. And we conducted our first ever SES talent management board to start doing succession planning based on those competencies. The second thing that we're taking a look at is it does no good to have education, training, and experience if they aren't all linked. And they need to be linked consistent with those requirements. So we've got a real uh, aggressive effort underway right now to take a look at our proficiency levels for those competencies and then mapping against all the learning objectives of all the courses that we as an Army buy so that we can make sure that we've got alignment and linkage between education, training, and experience for civilians. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, you need 100% of your civilians covered in those career programs so that you have people who can say, here's the career path, here's what's available, and here's how I'm going to make sure, if you're capable, that we actually live up to our end of the social contract. Finally, transparency. We're going to make sure that we have web displays to show people that the Army is walking the walk as well as talking the talk. So we want to show the Army what the results are, what we've been doing, so that other civilians who've seen how these programs do or don't work over time, they can see that if you actually go through these requirements-based efforts, we will find civilians who actually have career enhancement and career progression, to be honest with you. So, soup to nuts. You know, in a related topic on the military side, the, the chief and the secretary have us looking at the development of our future leaders and our, our military leaders. So we're looking at creating the general officers uh, in 2037, and how does that align with R4Gen? Does it align with R4Gen? And what does the op tempo that we're going through now um, have an impact on civilian education, on their military education? And, and how do we have to adjust policies in order to, to do the right things to grow our leaders? But, but right now we've got some concerns. There's some second, third order effects uh, on our military leaders that, that we will have great tactical operational leaders that, that have no, no experience at the strategic level, uh, and, and even though they do strategic engagements in, in Iraq, Afghanistan, and other locations, um, the Washington, D.C. AOR, if you will, area of operations is, is really quite different. So, for example, we, we, we were looking at a, a 1989 graduate of West Point Infantry, uh, two-time below the zone. Uh, he spent four years of key and developmental job as a major, uh, much more than we'd like. We, we plan on two years, but because of the rotations, because of the overlap, uh, staying in theater, uh, being asked by name to stay in a different job, uh, he, he stayed four years. Uh, he, he was uh, then so good that uh, he stayed on uh, to do his battalion command, went straight into that. It was a two-year battalion command, 15-month uh, deployment, extended out to about three years of battalion command. I came out of that and went straight into a G3 job, skipped the senior service college because he was one of our best, and uh, went into the uh, G3 job and came out of that and again selected for brigade command. So came straight out of G3 into brigade command, and because his uh, deployment and R4Gen timeline don't line up with his two-year command, 
he'll do about 30 months of uh, brigade command. He'll come out of that and really won't have an alignment with senior service college. So it's about seven months or so that he'll have to hang around and then he'll go to senior service college after brigade command. Sometime after that, we'll find time to get him joined. Uh, so, so at about the 27, 28 year point, uh, one of our, our best officers will, will be looking at for general officer. And I was speaking to the retired four stars and some of these were retired as four stars at 30 years of service. And, and, and I think nobody's looking at whether, you know, how long you have to stay and, and, and our leaders want, are committed to staying and, and doing the right things for our, our military. But, but we've got to figure out how in this timeline that I just described, do we carve out time for civilian education, professional military education, fellowships and opportunities at, in the Congress, in the executive branch, uh, with industry, so that we have developed and broadened leaders that can lead the Army of tomorrow. Uh, and, and we're working on it, but we've got challenges, equally challenging on the civilian side. Okay. Sir, thank you. Um, this, uh, this question is more for a General Carpenter and General Purser. Um, I've heard the, here and in other uh, breakouts that uh, assured access is important and operational reserve is important. We can't go back to a strategic reserve. And I think the leadership, Army leadership is on board with that. Um, Mr. Lamont even stated in questions for record to the Hill that uh, the operational reserve is the way ahead. And in light of that, he feels as though that the TTHS account is insufficient for what, what we're at being asked the reserve component to do. Um, in light of the fact that the AC is holding approximately 12 to 13 percent of its end strength in a TTHS account and for the Army National Guard it's closer to 2 percent. What, what is the future hold for establishing more, a more robust TTHS account? And I'm not sure, ma'am, what, what the OCAR uh, percentage is, but how does that play into where we are prioritizing a TTHS account knowing fully, fully well the sensitivities of adding, a, per, you know, perhaps additional people but not taking structure and that trade-off in a limited resource environment uh, that we're in. That, that, is, uh, that is our number one manning challenge in the Army National Guard. Uh, a couple of comments up front. Uh, General Vaughn had a plan to grow a TTHS account inside the Army National Guard and that growth was going to be by increasing the end strength. His initial plan was to go to 371,000. Uh, the, what I described earlier in terms of uh, where we found ourselves in March of 2009 at 368,000, we were en route to 371,000 end strength. And end strength, by the way, we were not authorized to be at. I think everybody would concede in the environment we find ourselves in right now, the possibility of growing the end strength of the Army National Guard is probably very remote, if not nil. And so the strategy or the challenge for us is how do we man our units? And we are going to have to do that. As we get to the objective cycle of the Army Force Generation model, the Force Com Commander has a plan where five National Guard brigades, first ever and historic, will go to the combat training center every year. That means that no matter how we do this thing, we are going to have to show up with something that looks like a P2, P1 team at the National Training Center for five brigades on the Army Force Generation model, read that every four to five years. We think that the success we've had in terms of unit manning since 2007 has been to take unit plugs, read that, a company, and plug that into a battalion uh, from somewhere else. A battalion plugged into a brigade from two different states provides a team, full up team, that is ready to go with a battalion commander and a battalion sergeant major and that if we institutionalize this cross-leveling, these unit plugs, in a regular program basis as opposed to the ad hoc cross-leveling we've been doing for the last three or four years, we've found that we can produce full up ready units to go down range and deploy. And the issue that General Farisee described and that General Bostic mentioned on the active component side where you find 16 percent of a brigade formation is not available for deployment, we've still got that inside the Army National Guard, only it's about 25 to 30 percent that's not deployable inside the brigade. And so the issue here, and I, I won't go into much detail at this point, but if we can institutionalize the unit plugs of a battalion inside of a brigade, we will produce 
in, in a one to five objective model in the Army Force Generation model, we will produce full up units across the board. So we think that the TTHS argument, while very important, is not relevant uh, to the extent that it was before in Warforgen, if you will, as it is in our